I want to welcome you uh, to our uh, fourth day of our Adam Smith Week, sponsored by the Center for Public Choice and Market Process. I'm Professor Peter Kelcano. I'm the director of the Center for Public Choice and Market Process and a professor of economics here at the College of Charleston. Uh, the mission of the Center for Public Choice and Market Process is to advance the understanding of the economic, political, and moral foundations of a free society. We're halfway through the week and we have our busiest day today with several exciting events left today and tomorrow. So please review the schedule. We'll be posting the link uh, to find the schedule and for registration uh, in the chat in just a minute here. Uh, but that link is go.cfc.edu slash ASW. I encourage you to look at our website, our Facebook page, follow us on Twitter and Instagram to learn more about the center and what we do and our, our programming. We are not alone in celebrating Adam Smith Week this year. Nine other centers and organizations are joining us offering events and sponsorship. In particular, I wanna thank the Institute for the Study of Free Enterprise at the University of Kentucky for partnering with us on this event. Um, I first learned about our speaker today by hearing him on Econ Talk, which if you are not familiar with, I encourage you all to uh, learn about and go out and listen to. Uh, and I want to thank my colleagues at Liberty Fund for connecting us and making this event possible today. The center provides a variety of programs, including our mentoring programs. And now I want to introduce one of our market process scholars, Alec Patsy, to introduce our speaker for this afternoon. I'm Alec Patsy, market process scholar at the College of Charleston. Uh, I want to start off by thanking Dr. Cocano and Dr. Maldonado, as well as the other College of St uh, Charleston faculty who make uh, Adam Smith Week here at the college possible. In addition, I would like to extend our gratitude to the Institute for Humane Studies for sponsoring this event. It's an honor to introduce our guest today, Dr. Keith Smith. Dr. Smith graduated from the University of Oklahoma College of Medicine and has been a board certified anesthesiologist in private practice since 1990. In 1997, he co-founded the Surgery Center of Oklahoma, an outpatient surgery center in Oklahoma City owned by 40 of the top physicians and surgeons in central Oklahoma. Each year, the center treats thousands of patients at a fraction of the cost of traditional hospitals. Dr. Smith serves as the medical director, CEO, and managing partner while maintaining an active anesthesia practice. Dr. Smith, thank you for being here today and taking the time to speak with us. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Alec. Thank you to the College of Charleston for including me in this prestigious event. My remarks are meant to enlighten those unfamiliar with the various industry scams enabled by government and to embolden defenders of the free market in the medical industry. I hope to accomplish this in the next few minutes by discussing, discussing the history and the operation of the Surgery Center of Oklahoma, a working model of free market delivery of medical services. Surgery Center of Oklahoma has provided inspiration for many who have followed and grim consternation for the exposed price gougers and those in government who enabled them, as you shall see. Just over 23 years ago, the operation of the Surgery Center of Oklahoma began with a simple mission, deliver the highest quality care at a reasonable and disclosed price. We fancied ourselves free marketeers, uh, not aware of how far we had yet to go to accurately claim this title. Our mission was the opposite mission of the hospitals where we had previously worked. Then as now, hospitals are focused almost exclusively on revenue, many times inflicting surprise and bankrupting bills on their victims. As physicians working in these hospital systems, we were unwitting accessories to these crimes. We intended to operate our facility differently, intending to serve as both medical and financial advocates for our patients. The Surgery Center of Oklahoma is now viewed as a model of medical services delivered free market style, partly because of this simple mission. For the past decade, due to posting all-inclusive pricing online and the effects this move has imposed on the marketplace. I'd like to set the stage by describing the state of the industry at the, at the time we decided to walk away from it. Next, I'll cover the significance and effect of our price posting. Then we'll review what this price transparency has revealed about the American health cartel and its cozy relationship with Uncle Sam. 
I'll conclude with the reasons we should be optimistic about this industry, all thanks to the power and the appeal of the free market in action. When I began practicing in 1990, Medicare, the government, paid me about $1,100 for the anesthesia services required for an open heart surgery. In 1992, two years later, this payment was cut in half. A year later, that amount was cut in half. The last two payments I received from Medicare were as follows, $285 for a six hour cardiac anesthetic and $78 for the anesthesia services required for a knee replacement. These fees had been imposed through a mechanism referred to as the resource-based relative, relative value scale, more appropriately referred to as the Rosemary's baby of healthcare pricing. According to the anointed economist at Harvard who birthed this scheme, every physician service had a price and they knew what those prices were. I'd read enough about economics by this time to know that this imposed pricing was not personal, as punishing as it seemed. Prices are signals after all. and Medicare was sending me a signal regarding what they thought the service I provided was worth. I felt obligated to respond with a rational signal of my own, so I quit participating in their scheme. I'd also come to the conclusion that government had no money it had not stolen, and that to accept payment from the government was to accept stolen property. I stopped accepting their payments in 1993 and treated Medicare patients free of charge. I still had much to learn about pricing, but I did notice that services underpriced by Medicare became scarce and overpriced services became abundant. After all, prices imposed on any industry by central planners are always wrong, either too high or too low, and they deliver predictable results. I would learn years later that true prices can only be those which emerge from a competitive market process. Private insurance carriers seized on the fear created by this deep slashing of physician fees, drastically reducing the amounts they paid physicians. Hospitals, emboldened fear mongers, cashed in on their opportunity to cheaply purchase physician practices and leverage physicians too shaken to bargain effectively. To legitimize their bold strategy, hospitals cranked up their propaganda machine, proclaiming loudly then as they do now that they're going broke. Hospitals flush with cash even laid off critical nursing staff to justify this narrative. I've always found it interesting the hospital emergency rooms, the supposed primary source of their financial woes, always seem to have a crane in front assisting their expansion. Who builds on to their loss leader? And yet, the lack of paying patients in the emergency room was part of the poor mouthing narrative in the 1990s, just as it was during the debates that led up to Obamacare's enactment. We're told that hospitals always need more Medicare money to stay afloat. Hospitals need for states to expand Medicaid or they'll most certainly face closure, right? This broken record has been playing for quite some time. While physician pay was in a nosedive, hospital revenues were on the rise, much of it coming from patients victimized by their billing apparatus. Using their strained budget argument and narrative, hospitals began to refuse surgeons the equipment they required. In retrospect, a last straw moment in the tipping point that enabled our escape. No physician I worked with desired to practice medicine in a manner controlled by the rising administrator class. Our only choice was to find a way to practice outside of the hospital environment, no longer an accessory to the hospital's financial crimes against patients. The golden rule and the concept of mutually beneficial exchange is a large part of what drove me to become a physician. While the vast majority of physicians embrace honest and mutually beneficial exchange, it turns out the vast majority of hospitals do not. Hospital commerce is the equivalent of a financial drive-by shooting, particularly commerce conducted by the so-called not-for-profit systems. I believe then, as I do now, that a facility owned and controlled by the physicians was the model most likely to ensure that patients were not financially brutalized. 
My great uncle was the only physician in a small Oklahoma town for years, living in the top floor of his house, the bottom floor serving as his clinic in the town's hospital. He was completely accountable for the entirety of what his patients were charged. He could do everything about what they were charged, including charge them nothing, and he did this regularly. Dr. Walter Bays was a hero in the town of Chickasha, Oklahoma, and very well to do. Ownership of the facility or institution by doctors was the rule until government intervention in the 1950s and 1960s in the form of the Hill-Burton Act made this model more difficult. The explosion of hospital charges in the 1990s created an opportunity for physicians to own, once again, the facilities where they practiced and demonstrate the superiority of the physician-owned model. The model was superior as it allowed for the elimination of the greediest profit seeker from the equation, the not-for-profit hospital. Dr. Steve Lantier and I walked away from our hospital anesthesia practices in April of 1997 and began the operation of the Surgery Center of Oklahoma 30 days later with 10 surgeons with whom we had a good working relationship. We had no idea if we would break even, make money, or go broke trying. We had no pro forma. We had no business experience whatsoever. All we knew was that hospitals were awful, inefficient places charging patients gigantic prices. The opportunity seemed obvious. Our faith in this dream and in the idea that if you're cheaper and better, you'll beat the competition formed the basis of our business plan. We also decided we would never accept a dime of government money and have stayed true to this mission and plan. The first week we were open, we received a call from a patient who had a breast mask she wanted removed and she asked how much we would charge her. She had no insurance. This was the call we had all hoped for, the reason we had opened, and yet I had no idea how to answer her question. I placed her on hold and called our general surgeon and asked him how much he wanted for his fee. He had no idea. I told him to pick a fee or like a Harvard professor, I'd pick one for him. He said $500. I thought this was very reasonable, so I hung up on him before he had a chance to reconsider. As an anesthesiologist, I basically bill for my time and I knew this surgery would take 20 or 30 minutes. The facility supplies were minimal. I was about to take her off hold when I realized she would want to know if she had cancer. I called a pathologist friend and asked him how much he wanted to examine the specimen. He had no idea. Nervous that this patient would hang up during the five minute hold, I pressed for an answer, $28 for the pathology. I informed the patient that our price was $1,900. For what, she asked. For everything, I said. She said, that's funny. The hospital down the street from you wanted $19,000 for the facility alone. I knew we were on the right track when after the case and the supply cost was tallied, I realized we'd made a profit. Had the pathology fees that apply to the examination of breast masses not increased so much over the years, our price would be the same now as it was in 1997 but alas, it's now $2,365. Only two other fees have increased since we began quoting them over the phone in 1997. <clears throat> Excuse me. Word spread and many uninsured patients came to our facility along with patients with high deductible health plans and health savings accounts. Most of the division one athletes had their surgery at our facility <clears throat> and our reputation in the community grew more solid every day. Dr. Lonte and I were both trained in pediatric anesthesia and particularly enjoyed this part of our practice. Nothing better builds the practice of an anesthesiologist than the careful anesthetic treatment of someone's child. The area hospitals hated us because patients could buy their surgeries at our facility for less than their insurance deductible at the hospitals. Paradoxically, no insurance companies would work with us. We would not understand this until much later after posting our prices. We were very busy and very successful early on. Within six months, I was distributing healthy profits to the partners, charging one-tenth what the local hospitals were charging for the same service. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
the hospitals were the first to attack us. <clears throat> they attacked us directly by attempting to ban physician ownership of facilities in the state of Oklahoma. This was done under the banner of trauma care, the hospitals falsely claiming that if surgeons own, own their own facilities, they would not treat trauma patients. No one knew, including me, that when the state legislature created the state trauma task force, that the underlying mission was to close physician-owned facilities. A Democrat legislator who saw us as an underdog, a champion of the poor, told me with a wink and a nod that I needed to be on this task force, a business saving favor he and I have since acknowledged. Our facility and another that had copied our model were the obvious targets of this task force. And surprisingly, there was no plan in place if representatives of either of our facilities argued our case in person. Our unexpected invitation and inclusion in this wannabe star chamber, chamber derailed their plans to scuttle our facility. <clears throat> it's worth noting that in our early days, it was the efforts of Democrat legislators that prevented our destruction. Most Democrats at the Oklahoma State Legislature saw us as underdogs. Many of them found our decision, decision to accept no government money refreshing. I started every conversation with the legislator by stating that I didn't want any money or favors. I just wanted to be left alone, allowed to demonstrate the power of the market. We asked that they frown on legislation that would hamstring our efforts, efforts which required no consideration in their budget meetings. This was very effective as they knew we were acting out of principle and were not favor seeking very much unlike the so-called not-for-profit hospitals running many poor patients to our doors. The Republicans, early champions of their crony hospital friends, now champion our approach, which now receives bipartisan support. We've asked to be left alone, and the Oklahoma legislators, other than early attempts to close our doors, have left us alone to their credit. This laissez-faire approach to physician ownership of facilities in Oklahoma partly explains why Oklahoma is the epicenter of the free market movement in this industry. In another direct attack, the big hospitals attempted to pass what became known as the 30% law. If passed, a facility had to receive at least 30% of its revenue from Medicare, Medicaid, or uncompensated care. Non-compliance was punished by payment of a penalty calculated to equal the degree of failure to comply. Obviously, the state government would be combing through our financial records and assessing a penalty equal to 30% of our gross income since we accepted no government funds. This was aimed squarely at our facility. Once again, a Democrat, Representative Fred Stanley, used his muscle to ensure this legislation went nowhere. This law was debated in public forums, to some of which I was invited to speak. In one heated exchange, a normally tight-lipped hospital executive asked me how much of our surgery center's revenue was uncompensated care. I was confused by his question, meant by him to be a devastating rebuttal to my remarks, but haunted by the insanity of his question. And I began to wonder if he had misspoken. Was uncompensated care a revenue item? Most people would think that uncompensated care is care delivered for which no compensation is received. It turns out this was not the case and I'll explain a little later. In another attack, the state health department was weaponized by the hospitals in an attempt to secure the medical records of all of the patients treated at our, at our facility in the year 2000. After they attempted to invalidate our operating license for failure to comply, we sued them only to discover they lack the statutory authority to seize these records. Their surrender is framed on the wall of my office. Because patients could pay the entirety of the cost of their care for less than their deductible and copay at in-network area hospitals, the insurance companies paying us out of network received intense pressure from the area hospitals for this lost business. 
likely threatened with retaliation in the form of higher prices billed to the insurance companies, the insurance groups began stacking deductibles, a process where patients going out of network had to meet their in-network deductible, then start again at zero to accumulate any out-of-network benefit. This deductible stacking put our facility out of financial reach of most patients who were insured who would otherwise rather pay us directly. We watched our business begin to fail. Up until this point, we had grown so rapidly that we had built a large facility that we now occupy and fortunately paid for its construction with no debt. This brand new huge facility was now without very many patients. The timing of this deductible stacking could not have been worse. Keep in mind that our reputation was unsurpassed. We were cheaper and we were better than any other facility nearby. In an unfettered market, there should have been a line out the door. Why had the insurance companies been complicit in this savage attack? Wouldn't they benefit from higher quality and lower prices? I decided to post our prices online. We had a list of prices we had quoted over the phone over the first 10 years of operation. It was a matter of launching a website, ensuring the surgeons were satisfied with their fees, and posting the prices. All of our prices were determined using the following method. I asked the surgeon how much they wanted, then added a price for anesthesia service, primarily based on time. The facility portion was priced as time and materials. These are the three primary components of surgical pricing and are simply added together. I've increased only three prices since we began quoting them and have lowered many more. I posted these prices in 2009 with three goals in mind. To make ourselves more known to those without insurance or whose deductibles were high, start a price war, and better understand the scams at work that had emptied our waiting room. I would argue that all three goals have been accomplished and will provide examples. The first patients to arrive after we posted prices were Canadians. This was instructive as these patients had so-called insurance coverage. There was no access, however, to the care many of them required. The most common story then as now for the Canadians was a patient waiting two years to see a gynecologist for a hysterectomy to stop their bleeding, bleeding usually so severe that intermittent transfusions were required. The first question a Canadian asks when they call us is how long they'll have to wait. Our answer, that there is no waiting time, is met with disbelief. A Canadian friend of mine has told me the old Canadian joke that no Canadian is truly happy unless standing in line. When I, asked to speak at, when I was asked to speak at a Vancouver event about our experience treating Canadians, I was blindsided by the defenders of the health system who had invited me to speak about the failures of their health system. Dr. Michael Humer, philosophy professor at University of Colorado, has written extensively on Stockholm Syndrome as a way to think about our relationship with the state. Never has this been more clear to me than when discussing the socialization of medic medical care, a conversation I've learned to avoid with the Canadian patients who travel to our facility. At the time we posted our prices, a hysterectomy and most other procedures along our northern border cost multiples of what we had listed online. The northern facilities on the border catering to Canadians requiring procedures unavailable in Canada lowered their prices, I would argue, in response to our price posting. As a result, the number of Canadians we see for this condition has decreased dramatically. You should know that there are Harriet Tubman-like brokers who help Canadians cross the border, finding for them affordable medical solutions essentially unavailable in Canada. These procedures are unavailable because the Canadian government, like all other governments with socialized medical schemes, balances its medical budget by rationing services. This is the only tool available to them as over half the provincial budgets are consumed by medical services. Millions of Canadians traveling to the United States have discovered that the only single payer upon which they can truly rely is themselves. Uninsured patients arrived after the Canadians. We were satisfying our first goal of making ourselves more known to the uninsured. 
Most were local, but a few were from far away. This has since changed. The vast majority of uninsured patients now come from states outside of Oklahoma. I believe the reason for this is as follows. As prices have fallen in Oklahoma, the price differences between our facility and the hospitals in our area who stand to lose this business has decreased. This is not as true in other states. In states like Alaska and Wisconsin, two of the most cartelized medical environments now send us more patients than many other states combined. While there are many examples of money saved uninsured individuals, one that sticks out is the patient from Georgia who required a urologic procedure and had received a quote of $40,000 just for the facility charge. A friend had told him about our facility and after he confirmed that our all-inclusive price was 4,000, he informed his urologist he was traveling to Oklahoma City. Having lost another patient to us the previous month, the urologist contacted the hospital and told them something had to be done as their price quotes were causing him to lose patients. The hospital matched our price and the patient stayed in Georgia. The patient contacted me and remarked that we had saved him $36,000 and we hadn't even performed his surgery. The price war, our second goal, had begun and was affecting prices far from Oklahoma City. Many patients over the years who have secured a price match from their local hospital using our website have traveled to our facility nonetheless, resentful of that facility's attempted robbery. Prior, prior to posting our pricing, I closely examined the fixed expenses required to operate our facility. One expense that stuck out was the health insurance we provided to our own employees at the surgery center. In the year 2000, we were paying $20,000 a month for our 30 employees. Knowing I would pay at least $240,000 per year for this coverage, I wondered if I could buy a policy with an $80,000 deductible and pay a lower premium by assuming this additional risk. An insurance friend informed me that this concept was called self-funding or self-insurance, and that this was indeed the strategy of companies much larger than mine. He also told me that I actually didn't need to assume nearly that much risk and went about looking for someone who would administer a self-funded plan for a company our size. To be clear, self-insured or self-funded companies pay for their employees' health expenses out of operating revenue rather than pay a company like Blue Cross to assume the risk. The company assumes the risk and pays someone to administer the benefit basically hands someone their checkbook to pay these bills. To give you an idea of the size of the self-funded proxy buyer, half of all medical bills are paid by the federal government. Of the other half, 80% are paid by self-funded buyers. We were able to self-fund and I now found myself caring about the medical decisions my employees were making. I realized that as their proxy buyer, I had the same sticker shock that an individual had who was buying their care from our surgery center. I ended the employee contribution to our health plan and waived almost all out-of-pocket expense for my employees. We saved an enormous amount of money, so much that I now believe that had we not self-insured, we would likely not have been able to make payroll during the dark times when our business declined after the deductible stacking. When we posted our prices, I hoped that a sticker-shocked, self-funded company would find me as our interests were aligned. Not long after our prices went live on our website, I met Jay Kempton, and a partnership dream came true and began to unfold. My introduction to the self-funded industry also marked the beginning of achieving our third goal, understanding the scams that were at work, hindering normal market function. Bits and pieces of countless conversations with industry insiders provided insight into the shenanigans that at first seemed inexplicable. Jay Kempton ran a company referred to as a third-party administrator that administered the self-funded plans of his clients. He had their checkbook and worked hard to save them money. 
he had begun to realize that he had run out of gas and ideas and that he couldn't save his clients much money unless they were willing to consider travel outside of the United States for medical services. Following the presentation of this idea, one of his clients, a good friend of mine, told him that he and I needed to meet. Jay could not believe what we had done. He'd been looking for someone like me, and I was definitely looking for someone like him. We signed a two-page contract, and his clients began buying directly from me. Other physician-owned hospitals and surgery centers losing business as Jay Kempton actively directed patients my way, ask what they had to do to keep their patients. He told them to give a price list just as I'd done. Jay didn't keep our arrangement a secret and true to form, told all of his competitors about what I was doing, even securing for me a speaking engagement to a national audience of his competitors, many of whom still buy from me as a result. I assisted and continue to assist my competitors in their efforts to copy our model. It was not in Jay's immediate interest to share my contact information with his competitors. Who shares a high quality, fairly priced vendor with their competitors? It was likewise not in my immediate interest to share our approach and methodology, but for Jay and I, this had become missional. Our outreach to others in the industry led to the formation of the Free Market Medical Association, about which I'll comment later. Our online pricing caught the eye of Reason Magazine not long after our website was launched. Reason Magazine's Jim Epstein discovered during his research for their mini documentary about our facility that our pricing was half what Medicare paid the big hospitals and less actually than Medicaid paid the hospitals. I've known without a doubt since then that hospitals are actually grossly overpaid in spite of their poor mailing. One Oklahoma CEO of a hospital regularly pays for full page newspaper ads that brag about the millions of dollars of care for which they've not been compensated. How much of your revenue is uncompensated care was the question that continued to haunt me. If uncompensated care was a revenue item, how was this calculated? I was also haunted by the fact that no insurance companies would work with us. Insurance companies collect premiums and pay claims and keep the difference as profit, right? It turns out there was more to it. And this conundrum was related to the revenue of uncompensated care. It turns out that hospitals need all the red ink they can find to justify the fiction of their not-for-profit status. If a hospital charges $100,000 and only collects $20,000, their books show an $80,000 loss. This fictitious loss, the calculation of which is completely under their control, performs two functions. First, it helps maintain their not-for-profit fiction, providing the justi justification needed to eliminate their tax burden. Keep in mind that not-for-profit means pays no tax. Second, this loss number forms the basis for a kickback the hospitals are paid by Medicare to the extent that they claim these losses. Hospitals receive padded Medicare payments based on the amount of charged services they claim to have not received. Or as I like to say, hospitals are paid even when they aren't paid. This is the revenue of uncompensated care, also known as disproportionate share hospital payments. Keep this in mind when you hear a hospital administrator say that his emergency room is killing him financially. The more they charge and don't collect, the more they make, basically. This is why there's a crane building onto every emergency room in the country. This also explains how hospitals can claim they're going broke on paper while purchasing television ads during the Super Bowl and buying out competitors and buying physician practices. A not-for-profit Oklahoma hospital always claiming to be on the financial ropes, recently purchased a $106 million piece of property. Go figure. Why would insurance companies go along with this? Why would an insurance company play along 
discounting $100,000 bills to $20,000. Insurance companies sell access to their networks based on the strength of their ability to apply discounts. The larger the discount, the more marketable selling access to the discounting network becomes. The ERISA lawyer, Corey Cook, frequently poses the following questions to audience she addresses. If I tell you I'll sell you my house for 50% off, what should be your next question? Everywhere but in the medical industry, the answer is obviously 50% off of what? We give bigger discounts, sales when brokers are peddling whatever PPO insurance plan is paying them the highest commissions. There is another reason the insurance companies love the high initial charge from the hospital and play along. Claims repricing is the phrase frequently used in the industry to describe this discounting of hospital charges. Think of insurance companies as claims repricers who charge for this service. It is standard for an insurance company to charge an employer a percentage of the discount they achieve on a hospital bill. No rocket scientist is required to see that the higher the initial hospital charge, the more the insurance company makes repricing the claim, applying their discounts. Unknown to most employers is the fact that hospital pricing and discounts are pre-negotiated, so no discount actually exists. I've been told it's not uncommon for an insurance company representative to ask a hospital to charge more for a service to increase the commission paid to the insurance repricer. Claims repricing represents an opportunity foregone when prices are posted for all to see. Another reason the insurance companies want nothing to do with my facility. <clears throat> we mustn't leave the insurance brokerage firms out of this picture. Insurance brokers and the firms for which they work receive commissions called overrides for inflicting these schemes on employer groups. Some of their commissions are revealed, but these overrides are not. These commissions are paid to the brokerages by the large insurance carriers who want an expensive claim experience, as this provides the justification for um, the increasing the next year's rates. It is not uncommon for broker commissions to be calculated as a percentage of claims made. In other words, the insurance broker and the brokerage house and insurance company paying them want their client to have a very bad year and a high claims experience, the percentage of claims commissions soaring as a result. Their commission on the next year's more expensive premiums also increases. Brokers work therefore very hard to ensure that employers never sniff a high quality and fairly priced facility like mine. My facility is great for the client, but not for the brokerage firm. Poor quality care and a high degree of complications leads to a very bad and expensive year for an employer's health plan, but a banner year for the brokerage. The interests are simply not aligned. I've left the most destructive industry for last. <clears throat> the federal government's interventions are indirect and direct. Indirect interventions are those which under the banner of patient safety or consumer protection, regulate the smaller innovators, smaller innovators out of the business, usually in the form of requirements or conditions which only the most gigantic cronies can endure. <clears throat> The medical loss ratio part of the Unaffordable Care Act is an example. While a requirement that no more than 30% of an insurance company's revenue can be spent on administrative duties is a requirement that a multi-billion dollar insurance company can endure, it is not endurable by the smaller ones. It is no mistake that there are just four or five medical insurance carriers following this requirement. The government's direct interventions are more devastating. The Stark Laws, named after California's Pete Stark, severely curtailed the growth of independent surgery centers and hospitals, 
restricting the supply side of care and therefore protecting near monopolies by health systems in the United States. <clears throat> in addition, Medicare pays hospitals more for the very same service rendered at an independent surgery center, much more. Medicare pays more for physician services when the physician is employed by a hospital. This discriminates, discrimination against physicians in private practice has driven many physicians into the arms of hospitals, happy to gobble up their practices on the cheap, then turn them away from their focus on patients and into revenue machines. <clears throat> Impossible coding regulations inflicted on private practitioners has also provided an advantage to the Death Star hospitals, along with expensive electronic medical record mandates. Medicare pays physicians even less if they don't use electronic medical record systems. <clears throat> to make matters worse, private insurance companies terrorize physicians and need only say, Medicare does that to justify their actions. I'll leave it at that, although I've not scratched the surface of the devastating role the federal government has played in the dysfunction of this industry. <clears throat> Our third goal, Better understanding the scams working against us remains a work in progress. While I don't pretend to understand all of the schemes at work, <clears throat> I do know that none of these shenanigans would be possible were it not for the interventionist state. <clears throat> Excuse me. While the hospitals, insurance companies, brokerage houses, big pharma, and many others deserve all the bashing they get, we must always remember <clears throat> Uncle Sam is driving the getaway car. A true free market would constantly cleanse the industry of those who do not truly serve patients and customers. The absence of a free market in this industry, not its failings, is responsible for the high prices and sporadic quality troubling to people in this country. Washington has auctioned off the favors necessary to construct the disastrous syndicate we refer to as the system. The growth of a competitive market in the industry, however, signals the inevitable day of reckoning for the scammers, nearer than many would guess. Acknowledging the scams of the cronies enabled by government has been key to the growth of what I call the value market, a throwback to the industry's economic model prior to the massive government intervention of the 1960s. <clears throat> Employer health plans, more aware of the vandals they've mistakenly trusted in the past and aware of pricing like that I've posted are voting with their feet. As the growing number of self-funded buyers patronize market-based medical practices, these patient-focused practices will become the norm in this country, benefiting everyone with lower prices and higher quality. The Free Market Medical Association, formed to bring willing buyers and sellers of services together, has been witness to tremendous growth, truly a cause for optimism. One of the goals of the Free Market Medical Association has been to promote sound economic thinking, as we believe that flawed thinking, many times by well-intentioned individuals, has led the industry down failed paths. <clears throat> I believe the Surgery Center of Oklahoma is open only because of sound economic thinking. Our dedication to the principle of property rights has kept government money out of our facility. We have no contracts with the insurance cronies and display all of our pricing online. For the exchange to be mutually beneficial for us to earn an honest buck, we've had to deliver a service that buyers with sticker shock, patients spending their own money, consumers with a choice valued. The idea that value determination is completely subjective has been very helpful to our organization. It's also cleansed our partnership of the notion prevalent in medicine that one should be paid according to their effort. Our partnership agreement has been guided by the concept of time preference, preventing our aging partners from embracing the short-sightedness so destructive to the firm. Our dedication to a pure free market model a journey that is still underway has been our mission and goal as we knew that maximum consumer and patient benefit would be the result. Other members of the Free Market Medical Association have gained insights critical to the success of their practices 
by matching their strategies with sound economic principles. <clears throat> Ron Paul, Jeff Deist, Yuri Maltsev have all been keynote speakers at the Free Market Medical Association conferences, highlighting the economic focus of the organization. I'm proud to report that Steve Forbes has graciously agreed to keynote this year's August conference in Plano, Texas. The Free Market Medical Association is the umbrella under which most free market innovators in the industry have gathered. Many believe that direct primary care, a model whereby a patient has unlimited access to a primary care doctor for a fee of less than $100 a month, this model represents the solution for chronic and preventative care. I believe that direct primary care as a model will eventually break the cycle of hospital employment of physicians bringing lower prices and higher quality of patients. As I always tell medical students, if you work for a hospital, you do not work for the patient. Direct primary care is affordable concierge care and these practices are prominently featured members of the Free Market Medical Association as are surgical practices, imaging facilities, and many other medical services. The buyers are also well represented in the FMMA. Dr. Peter Klein, sage of entrepreneurial economics, recently told me, it is one thing to talk about the market's application to the medical industry. It's quite another to actually implement it. The successful operation of these market-based practices has dashed the hopes of the naysayers who've said for years it could not be done. The power of these ideas should not be underestimated as a market was arguably created the moment our prices were visible. A market was definitely created when competitors posted their prices. The largest hospital in Oklahoma posted cash pricing on their website in response to our having done so, although there are many asterisks links to what is not included. UCLA copied my website word for word. Search UCLA cash pricing and compare what you find side by side with my facility's website. These giant medical centers realize they're in a competitive market hard as they have worked to insulate their cartel-like world. Cheaper and better is hard to argue against. Further proof of the power of these ideas is the following. Starting in 2021, those who don't post prices are, are facing possible fines levied by the state which created this mess. Even the dysfunctional state is withering due to market muscle. We must, however, resist the urge to encourage the bludgeon of the state in mandating price transparency. Uninsured patients have found visible pricing. A price war has begun. The scammers, more exposed than ever, are running for cover. Our initial goals have been accomplished and enough are woke to the lies of Uncle Sam's enabled cartel that market, not government solutions are growing and thriving. As the co-founder of the Free Market Medical Association, I am filled with optimism, watching the growth and acceptance of market discipline in the industry. The industry is now becoming saturated with an intense interest in value purchasing, the opposite of what the price gougers had hoped to have engineered. This economic model focused on consumer value stands opposed to the predominant model focused on revenue hashed out in the backroom deals of the past. Entrepreneurs recognizing that the growth of market discipline in the industry forecasts a more predictable future for their time and capital have seized this opportunity, aware that an industry that has wasted trillions will finally reward the more efficient. As sticker-shocked buyers become more aware of the ability to purchase high-quality medical services at a known price, the transformation to an affordable environment in spite of government will become a reality for everyone. Thank you very much.